This podcast is brought to you by GoMoto, the service lane kiosk that grows your business. Want to increase revenue, improve the customer experience, and maximize service efficiency? Visit GoMoto.com to learn more. G-O-M-O-T-O dot com. Want to dive deeper into the topics you hear about on Daily Drive? We're offering listeners a special offer, 20% off a one-year Automotive News digital subscription. That gets you access to all of our news, information, and analysis made for automotive industry leaders like you. Go to autonews.com slash daily drive promo to redeem. Welcome to Daily Drive for Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. I'm Jake Neer with Automotive News in Detroit and for Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today on the show, uniform members ratify their contract with Stellantis in Canada. Cruise halts production of its origin driverless van. And Mazda says a U.S. sales record is in sight. Plus, it's Drowsy Driving Prevention Week. Sleep scientist and former NHTSA chief, Dr. Mark Rosekind, talks about a new study that says U.S. teens show high rates of sleepiness behind the wheel. We very often talk about impairment traditionally as three Ds. So that's drunk, drugged, and distracted. But really it's four Ds, and we need to add drowsy driving as the fourth one, which is just as dangerous and risky as any other of those impairments. Let's run through all the news you need to know to keep up in the auto industry. Unifor capped off nearly three months of bargaining with the Detroit Three on Monday. Union members at Stellantis ratified a new collective agreement with the automaker with 60% approval. The contract covers about 7,900 members at Stellantis's Windsor Assembly Plant, Brampton Assembly Plant, and Etobicoke Castings Plant. The new contract tracks with the pattern set by Unifor's bargaining committee and its deal with Ford of Canada in September and its agreement with General Motors Canada in October. It includes general wage increases of 15% over the three-year term, the reactivation of cost-of-living allowance top-ups, and bonuses for full-time staff upon signing of $10,000 Canadian, equivalent to about $7,300 U.S. dollars. General Motors says it plans to temporarily halt production of its fully autonomous Cruise Origin van. The move comes just days after Cruise said it was pausing all driverless operations. The move was first reported by Forbes, citing an audio recording of Cruise CEO Kyle Vogt's address at an all-hands meeting. According to Forbes, Vogt told staff during the meeting that the company has produced hundreds of Origin vehicles already and that it is, quote, more than enough for the near term when we are ready to ramp things back up. A GM spokesperson who spoke with Reuters confirmed it was temporarily pausing production of the Origin. Last month, Cruz said it would halt operations nationwide after California regulators suspended the robo-taxi operator's license, saying its self-driving vehicles were a risk to the public. GM will likely build a more affordable version of the Chevrolet Bolt in Kansas and a new series of premium electric vehicles for Cadillac and Chevrolet in Michigan as part of its planned $13 billion investment in U.S. manufacturing. That's according to sources who spoke with Reuters. The people say GM is considering whether to build the lower-cost version of the Bolt electric utility vehicle at the Fairfax plant in 2025 and the premium EVs for Cadillac and Chevy in Lansing, Michigan, beginning in 2027. Those premium EVs could include a pure electric performance model with the Corvette name. GM committed nearly $2 billion for future EV production in its tentative contract agreement with the UAW, The union summary did not specify products or timing for the Lansing and Fairfax plants. GM declined to share future product details on Monday, but the automaker said in a statement to Automotive News that it's, quote, pleased that the new tentative agreement allows us to continue to invest in our U.S. manufacturing footprint and provide good jobs for our team members. And Mazda's profit grew by a third in the latest quarter on rising sales of higher margin crossovers such as the CX-50 and CX-90. It also got help from foreign exchange rate gains. The results are prompting the Japanese carmaker to lift its outlook and target record earnings for the current fiscal year. Mazda's newest forecast calls for all-time highs in revenue, operating profit, net income, 
and U.S. vehicle sales in the current fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. It expects the all-important North American market to continue to power the earnings surge. That market accounts for some 40% of the company's global sales. In announcing the financial results on Tuesday, CFO Jeffrey Guyton said Mazda expects U.S. sales alone to reach a fiscal year record of 389,000 vehicles. That would register a 22% increase over the 301,000 vehicles sold the previous year and top the high of just under 380,000 set in 1986. And those are today's headlines. Coming up, we'll hear from renowned sleep scientist and former NHTSA chief, Dr. Mark Rosekind, about the problem of drowsy driving on the roadways and how to prevent it. That's next on Daily Drive. The auto industry's shift to carbon neutrality is here and it's accelerating. But is it enough? This is a moral imperative, an economic imperative, a moment of peril but also a moment of extraordinary possibilities. No more hesitancy, no more excuses, no more waiting for the others to move first. There is simply no more time for that. Driving to Zero is a new podcast series from Automotive News that looks at the auto industry's roadmap to carbon neutrality. We take a big picture look at the environmental, political, and social trends pushing the move toward a greener future and we pull back the curtain on how these decisions are being made at the highest levels. I said, you know, the, the headline that you need is, is GM believes in an all electric future. And I think Dan Ammon and Mary Barra pretty much said the same thing, which is, is like, but, but we, we don't. Spoiler alert, they came around to that idea. Find out how and much more. I'm Jake Neer. Join me and Automotive News Executive Editor Jamie Butters on Driving to Zero, available now wherever you get your podcasts. Your service check-in process sets the tone for your customer's entire visit. Do your customers wait longer than five minutes to check in for service? Are your advisors presenting upsells to every customer every time? How often is the opportunity for a trade appraisal missed? When your service drive gets busy, these inefficiencies directly impact revenue. Give your customers the option to handle the entire check-in process themselves, from appointment scheduling through final confirmation in under two minutes. Customers have the experience they want while selling themselves, which means your advisors are freed up to focus on profit-producing activities. It's a win-win for CSI and your revenue. Introducing a smarter service lane, GoMoto is the self-service kiosk designed to grow your business. If you're ready to start increasing revenue, improving the customer experience, and maximizing service efficiency today, visit GoMoto.com. That's G-O-M-O-T-O dot com. Welcome back to Daily Drive. I'm Jake Neer with Kellen Walker. It's Drowsy Driving Prevention Week, the National Sleep Foundation's annual campaign to bring awareness to the problem of being sleep deprived behind the wheel. The NSF is marking this week by releasing a new study on the impact of drowsiness on teen drivers. Dr. Mark Rosekind is a renowned sleep expert and formerly served as the administrator of NHTSA from 2014 to 2017. He spoke with our own Jamie Butters about the study, as well as how advanced driver assistance systems might help or hurt the problem of driving while drowsy. Jamie reached him in Silicon Valley. Mark Rosekind, welcome to Daily Drive. Pleasure to be with you. You're here as a former board member of the National Sleep Foundation, as well as a highly decorated sleep expert. The National Sleep Foundation has a new study out on the prevalence of drowsy driving among teens. How bad is the situation? It's already pretty bad. Uh, We know from the results of this year's National Sleep Foundation survey that one out of six teenagers um, in their first two years of driving are already reporting driving drowsy, enough that they were struggling to keep their eyes open. And the reason that's such a big deal is we know adults are at about 60%. So why is there a really important message here is we want to keep that 16% in those adolescents as low as we can so they don't become the 60% of adults who are now drowsy driving on our roadways, right? So this this is huge for prevention for road safety. It's about establishing good habits that they can keep through their adult driving years. 
Yes. And we'd prefer if zero out of six were drowsy driving now. But the point is, we really want to get the message out, you know, sleep first, drive alert. And if we can do that now, then we'll prevent the future of them as adults still doing drowsy driving on a road, keeping all of us at risk. It was interesting to me that the teens see drowsy driving as risky, but not as risky as drunk, drugged, or distracted driving. Are they wrong about that? Yes. And we very often talk about impairment traditionally as three Ds. So that's drunk, drugged, and distracted. But really it's four Ds, and we need to add drowsy driving as the fourth one, which is just as dangerous and risky as any other of those impairments. And one of the things I like to point out is, you know, not everybody's had a drink before they drive, and they're not on drugs necessarily. Not everybody's on their phone, but everyone who's behind the wheel needs to be awake, and we'd prefer alert when they're actually driving. And we also know that if you're not getting the sleep you need, all the other things get worse. So all those other impairments actually are worse if you're getting insufficient sleep as well. Is there any evidence, are teens more sleep deprived on average than they were in previous generations? I mean, in some ways, it seems like they have healthier attitudes about a lot of things, but, you know, they're young people and they tend to push themselves to the limits. Do you have any sense of that? Absolutely. And one of the findings from the NSF study is that, you know, the one out of six that are talking about this, like, what are the reasons? Well, it's school and jobs. And, you know, for all of us, adults included, there's just not enough hours in the day. And the number one thing that people cheat on is their sleep. And to your point, teenagers in particular are getting even more pressure. And so we know both school, including early start times, jobs. Another finding from the study was if you had a job, you were two times as likely to be reporting the drowsy driving as if you didn't have the paying job. So, yeah, I I think the pressures are even higher. Um, both school and work. So we're seeing even more. And of course, I'm sure we'll chat about the other one of the D's is distraction. And so, of course, you know, cell phones, you think about how they've, you know, just been hugely penetrated our society is really a problem for everybody. And especially when we're talking about our teenagers who are still in their first one or two years of driving experience, they're even more vulnerable. Yeah, those findings about jobs uh, really hit home for me. Uh, Back in my day, I mean, it was that combination of school and work. I think probably like anybody who has who's trying to hold down two jobs, you're just always tired, (laughs) and uh, and sometimes it's it's that quiet, comfortable, warm hum in the car that can just put you right to sleep. And Jamie, thanks for bringing that up because this is a problem for everybody. Right. And, and we're focused on the adolescents, the teenagers in particular, because they're new at driving. But to your point, our whole society is pretty much sleep deprived, which means that we're basically all prone to in the right environment, like what you just described, to having our brains fall asleep. And so, you know, anybody who's not getting sufficient quantity or quality of sleep is going to be at risk. And I always point out this this really gets people bothered sometimes, but. It ends up, when you're going 70 miles an hour, if you have your time slowed by even 50 milliseconds because of being having insufficient sleep, that can lengthen your braking distance by five feet. So think about it. Even 50 milliseconds, which you couldn't even notice, is enough to take you from being what? Kind of pissed off about somebody who stops abruptly in front of you to literally being in a crash, right? And, And unfortunately, too many people both underestimate the importance of sleep and aren't always good judges of how sleep-deprived they might be. Well, and I think back to your comments earlier on where drowsiness, you know, should rank with the other Ds, right? I mean, if you're drunk or drugged, your reaction's slower, but you might still be keeping your eyes on the road and as engaged as you can be. If you're distracted, you know, you're looking away, you're completely ignorant, and you're driving full speed, but you can, um, you could hear a beep, you could hear a squeak, you could just know to remember to look up. But if your eyes close on you <laughs> because you can't keep them awake anymore, you can't see what's going on and you can't react even slowly. Yes, and I, I got it. This is such a great point. You know, everyone I think would agree that if you say, gee, if you fall asleep at the wheel while you're driving, that's not safe. Hopefully everyone would agree to that. <laughs> what most people don't realize is there's a... Con- a big continuum between when you're awake and when you actually fall asleep. And so if you haven't had enough sleep, 
way before you actually fall asleep at the wheel, your performance goes down and it becomes more variable. So it's what I was talking about, like with the braking, right? It, you can even have your eyes open and still be making decisions and reacting to things, but they could be slowed by 20, 50, 75%. Any of those things, again, your reaction time, your decision making, just your vigilance to what's going on, all of those are going to put you at risk. So if a situation comes up that you've got to react, you're vulnerable to having something really bad happen. So the National Sleep Foundation uh, had some recommendations, you know, of course, get enough sleep <laughs> uh, regularly, uh, plan long trips with a companion, schedule regular stops. There was also one about being mindful of warning signs and saying, you know, frequent blinking or yawning uh, can be a warning sign and difficulty with lane and speed control was cited as a sign of drowsiness. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you think about the advanced driver assistance systems, you know, that can help keep a car in its lane or keep you from uh, running into the car in front of you if it's driving slower than you have your cruise control set to? So, you know, I'm here to talk about sleep and drowsy driving on behalf of the National Sleep Foundation, but we're having this conversation also because I was formerly the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. <laughs> yes. And and I say that because your question, again, is so on target, which is the numbers are horrific of how many people's lives we lose on our roadways. OK, so I'm a firm believer in technology, including those assistance systems. They're going to help you with blind spot monitorings or lane keeping, you know, automatic emergency braking, as you know, which we worked on, you know, very aggressively, et cetera. It's like any of those can help support somebody, right, that is suffering from insufficient sleep and is drowsy while they're actually behind the wheel. So, again, I think the technology is great. Now, as you know, a lot of those ADAS technologies can also make people complacent. And so there is this balance, right, of making sure the classic to me is blind spot monitors where people just stop looking over their shoulder for things, right? And so, you know, again, I think um, they can be great advantages, but they're just tools. And we want to make sure we're doing the right thing, even with support from those tools. Yeah, I feel like maybe the hope would be if drowsiness creeps up on you, you know, that technology can buy you the second chance to realize you need to pull over and take your sleep more seriously. And, and Jamie, let's put a big exclamation point on that because the standard things, which is, you know what, I'm just going to roll the window down, crank up the radio, uh, you know, I'm going to put the lights on in the car, et cetera. Those things can actually last, but maybe 10 minutes. I mean, they can actually be effective, but only last for 10 minutes. So to your point, it's just a signal when you see these things, your head's right, you're blinking, your head's nodding, et cetera. Those are signals you got to pull over before something really bad happens. So this teen study was released in conjunction with Drowsy Driving Week, uh, which is going on right now. Uh, it always comes in the wake of daylight saving time, uh, at the end of daylight saving time. And that's always curious to me, because isn't this the week that we're all well rested after getting the extra hour of sleep over the weekend? Well, again, what a great question, because Drowsy Driving Prevention Week comes, you're right, right after the time zone change in the fall. And it ends up that fall back get you that extra hour. In the spring, when you spring forward, we actually see an increase in car crashes because everybody's sleep deprived, okay? So to your point, what we really hope is when people get that extra hour, they actually use it for sleep, you know, and not just stay, right, still sleep deprived. Um, but yes, this is the week where you hope they're gonna be doing better, whereas in the spring, we actually see pretty significant uh, increases in crashes for multiple days after the change. Mark Rosekind is a former NHTSA chief and NTSB member. He's a renowned sleep researcher who has been honored by NASA and with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Sleep Foundation, of which he is a former board member. Mark Rosekind, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. And thank you, Jamie. That's Daily Drive for today. I'm Jake Neer and for Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to automotive news journalists Lindsay Van Hulley and Hans Grimel for their reporting for today's podcast. We also had reporting from David Kennedy of our sibling publication, Automotive News Canada. You can get the latest news on roadway safety, union ratification votes, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Come back tomorrow for a look at some of the biggest challenges ahead for the auto industry's transition to carbon neutrality. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. 